finishing the bread now we're coming on to the wine if you've got would like an individual cup we'll bring that round to you just put pop your hand up if you've got a cold or you just particularly want a small individual cup you can have one
Luke 23. The door opened and the pastor entered the church. And the little boy said to his dad, what does that mean, dad? He said it means that the pastor is going to lead us in worship. The pastor walked in, up the pulpit, put his hands together and shut his eyes. The little boy said, what does that mean, Dad? He said, the pastor's going to lead us in prayer. Then the pastor got his big black Bible and opened it wide on the pulpit. And the little boy said, what does that mean, Dad? And his dad said, that means that he's going to preach from the Word of God. The pastor took off his watch and laid it down by the, the Bible. The little boy said, what does that mean, Dad? He said, absolutely nothing. <laughs> <laughs> we have permission to use the hall here a little bit longer than usual, so for those that are part of Chase, wondering if the caretakers are uh, going to come in and throw us out, don't worry. You know, last words are very significant. If you look up last words of people, it's very interesting because it tells you something about those people. For instance, Oscar Wilde said, as he lay on his deathbed, either this wallpaper goes or I do. <laughs> There's a very sad story of a man who was a general, John Sedgwick, who was a Union commander in the American Civil War. And he was in a battle in 1864, and he stood up in this battle, and his last words were, they couldn't hit an elephant from this distance. <laughs> I just think about it. Yeah. <laughs> they couldn't have an elephant from this distance. Okay. John Wesley, one of my favourite last words, he said the same thing three times. So he lay on his deathbed, surrounded by his family and friends and believers there. He said this he said, Best of all, God is with us. Best of all. God is with us three times. That's real to me. You know, Jesus is the exception because his last words were different. He had last words from the cross as he died, and then he rose again. So he had uh, more than last words. <laughs> I'm not sure if you can call them last words, but. You know, in verse 46 in Luke 23, the last thing he said on the cross is this, Father, into your hands I commit my spirit. <coughs> Father, into your hands I commit my spirit. And I don't know if you realise it, but Jesus was a man who lived by faith. And he lived by the faithfulness and graciousness of the Father, trusting that the Father would raise him from the dead. Jesus committed all to the Father there and committed himself for God to raise him from the dead. You know, a little while before that, he cried out, my God, why have you forsaken me? Momentarily, the father turned his back on the son and on sin because the son became sin for you and for me. Jesus did that for us. Doesn't that touch your heart? That he became the very thing that he hated most. He became sin for you and for me. Why have you forsaken me, he said. He was bearing the penalty of sin for you and me. He lived the life that we should have lived and died the death that we should have died. That's what happened. And do you know why? Because it was necessary for us to be born again. That's the only way that it could happen. When Jesus died on the cross, he freed us for eternity from sin, from all that the first Adam plunged us into. He set us free. You know, there was a hard-bitten soldier standing there at the cross. He was a centurion, so that means he'd been through the mill. He knew what he was talking about. He fought for Rome probably seen a number of people die. A hard character. And he stood there as Jesus died and he said, surely this really is the Son of God. 
something affected him so mightily there, and certainly it was. But what about Jesus' last commands to us? We'll go into chapter 24 of Luke. In verse 46 again, it says this, Thus it's written, and this is Jesus speaking, that the Christ would suffer and rise again from the dead the third day, and that repentance for forgiveness of sins would be proclaimed in his name to all the nations beginning from Jerusalem. You are witnesses of these things, and behold, I'm sending forth the promise of my Father upon you, but you're to stay in the city until you're clothed with power from on high. So there, he outlines what we're to be occupied with until he comes again. You do believe Jesus is coming back, don't you? <laughs> <laughs> and do you know who he's coming back for? Me. Us. <laughs> Praise the Lord, isn't that a wonderful thing? I don't know about you, but I look at the world and I think, how much longer can he go on with the things that are happening? We're starting to see a lot of the signs. But Jesus is coming back, but he said, look, whilst you're waiting, this is how you're to be occupied. Now you may be more familiar with the Matthew version of it, so turn to Matthew chapter 28. We call it the Great Commission. And I just want to look at some of this. You know, when you think of it, Jesus' last commands must be vitally important for us for eternity. They set a pattern for our continued ministry. Now, four things are mentioned here. I'm going to read all authority. It says in verse 18, All authority has been given to me in heaven and on earth. Go therefore and make disciples of all the nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all that I commanded you, and lo, I am <coughs> with you always, even to the end of the age. Four things are mentioned there. The first one is go. Okay? Go, therefore. The second is make disciples. The third is baptise them. And the fourth is teach them. Now you may have been brought up to think that the Bible is a textbook. And it is a textbook. You can spend your time studying the text in the scripture and learn much from it, and you should do. But the Bible is something else as well. It's a test book. It's a book that's designed to test your revelation of God against what it says. You can be a theologian and an academic and use the Bible as a textbook and get a lot out of it or get nothing out of it. But when you look at it as a test book and you test that which God has put in your heart against what you find there, it finds you out. It makes you realise, hold on, where am I? As a young Christian, when I started to read the Bible, I became a Christian in my late teens, having never really read the Bible at all. Once I started reading it, having committed my life to Christ, I saw things there that weren't in my life. And so I wanted to get those things in my life because I realised it's a test book. If it's there, it's for me. If it's there, it should be in me. And so I read, and I read, and I read, and I found that God challenged my heart. Do you find God does it to you? He challenges you by the scripture? You can take it and academically study it. It won't do anything for you. But once you start looking at it and see that God's in this word, speaking to us, then it tests everything that's there. That's why I'm a charismatic. Because I started to read in the Bible, that God's still doing the same things all over again that he did back in the times of Jesus. Yeah. In fact, Jesus is the same yesterday, today and forever. Yeah. So I started saying in the church that I was in, why are we not praying for the sick? Well, we don't pray for the sick these days. Why are we not doing this? Well, we don't do that these days. I said, but hold on a minute, it's in the Bible. <laughs> I was too stupid then to know what I was saying, really. But really, it was God as well. And once I started going down that road, I'm afraid the rock set in. <laughs> and I wanted to see God do the things he did then, now. Yeah. And do you know Amen. what I found? That when you started practicing what it said, God did those things. Yeah. Yeah. Do you find the same? Yeah. Yes. Amen. Good. Amen. Turn around and say amen to someone. Amen. I've always wanted to do that. 
<laughs> the first thing we're going to look at is go. Go into all the world, make disciples. You know, we've got to be a church that's on the move. And we've got to be moving forward. That's the way that we've, we've got to go. In other words, we don't become static. Now, this gets beyond our comfort zone. I'm not sure I, I like that phrase very much, but I understand what it means. We're comfortable in certain areas in our life, and then God comes. That's the trouble with God. He will turn up <laughs> when we've just got everything sorted out. And when he does that, he pushes us on. So we've got to be prepared to risk our reputation. Now these guys here are risking their reputation associated with Chase. <laughs> All right? No, it might be the other way around. Yeah. <laughs> but Probably. we've got reputations. Even in the Christian world, you can have a reputation. If you want to be safe, you've come to the wrong place. <laughs> That's what I'm saying. God says you've got to go. You've got to be prepared to swim against the tide. Even in Christian circles. We've had a couple of missionaries staying with us for a few weeks. And they've just gone back to Africa. One of the things they've had to do is leave some things behind. Because they just can't take them. Now the things that they've left behind are very valid things for them. But you know, you can't take everything. And so they've had to leave behind some things. And I want to tell you that when we go, we leave behind some things that are essential but not essential. We may think they're essential, but God says they're not essential to your going. We have to go. We have to be on the move going forward. Is there a go in your life? This is the test bit. Is there some spirit of, I've got to go forward, Lord. I want more. I've got to find out more. I've got to do more. I'm not talking about keeping the law whereby you have to evangelise more, read your Bible more, pray more. They're all good things. But is there something in you that says, I just want what you've got for the world, Lord. And I've got the secret and I want to bring it. Now when it says go, it may mean going around the world. It may mean going around this nation. It may mean going to your next door neighbour your friends, the people you work with, <coughs> the people you rub shoulders with. But there's got to be a go in you, something that says, I've got to share this gospel, whatever. Mm. Now you may say, I'm not the sort of person to go around the world, don't you believe me? <laughs> we believe in short-term mission in Chase, and we do that because I know that once someone has been on a short-term mission, they're never the same again. So when your leader says to you, have you thought of going to such and such on a, a mission? You know what lies behind it now. They're trying to light a fire under you. Yes. That will burn on. Is that right, bro? Yeah, yeah. Yeah. That's what's happening. God's got to do something. You know, don't settle down in your Christianity. Don't settle down. It's very tempting to settle down. You know, I've reached the, the age of 50 now. <laughs> I'm approaching 50, but from each direction. <laughs> but it's tempting, as you get older, to settle down. You think, well, I'll just retire and take my life easy. That's not God's way. Yeah. Now, God knows <laughs> your needs. He's not going to put you in a running race that you can do, you do when you're 18, but you can't do when you're 70. God's not a fool, but don't settle. Don't settle down. I'll tell you why, because the time's too short. I was at a, a conference the other day of uh, an organisation, it's a, a book organisation, and there was a little testimony. I can't tell you the nation, uh, I don't want to say too much about it, except to say this, there's a Christian bookshop in this nation and into this Christian bookshop walked two Muslims. And they said, do you sell the Quran here? And the lady behind the counter said, no, we don't sell the Quran, but we sell the Bible. And she handed the Bible to one of the men who recoiled and wouldn't take it. 
And he said, I can't touch it because it's a holy book and I'm not, I suppose the world would be sanctified. I'm not clean enough to touch it. So she, being a sharp character, reached behind her and brought out a DVD and gave him the DVD. <laughs> and as he took the DVD, he burst into tears. And she said, why are you crying? And he said, last night, I had a dream. And in my dream, God said, these are the words of life. And a hand was giving me a DVD. And by the rings on your hand, it was your hand. Wow. You see, God's on the move. Yeah. He's going. So we better catch up. Be prepared. Okay, we're going to look at discipleship. What are disciples? Well, disciples are long-term followers. Did you get that? They're long-term followers. And they're those who would duplicate what they've learned from Jesus and from us. They imitate the Master. That's what a disciple does. Are you a disciple? Are you imitating Jesus? But I want to say this. It means that those of us that are not just in authority, but those of us that are Christians, we have to lead lives that can be followed. Because others will follow you. You may be privileged to have led someone to the Lord lately. They'll look to you for their spiritual life. Eventually they'll look to Jesus too. Don't get me wrong. But they'll look to you. They'll expect the same thing to be coming out of you that comes out of Jesus. Is that you? Is that your life? This is a test book. Does it test you? You know, in some cases it means that we have to grow up. We have to grow up to maturity, take our responsibilities before God seriously. You know, some people start higher behind false humility. They say, I couldn't do something like that. God wouldn't want to use someone like me. Why not? Why not? If he saved you, he saw something in you that perhaps you don't see in yourself. Don't have false humility. You know, I was called the humblest person in the church at one stage, and the church gave me a badge, and they took it away because I wore it. <laughs> <laughs> but you know, you can't hide behind false humility, or trying to be perpetually young or immature. People say, I'm immature. Look, if you're a, if you're a mature Christian, you should be teaching others. That's what happens in the scripture. You teach others how to do. If you're an older woman, you teach the younger women. If you're an older man, you teach the younger men. That's what the scripture says. Do you believe that? Yes. yes. Amen. Good. Okay, let's go on to baptism. You know what baptism does? It turns converts into disciples. We believe in baptism, baptizing people as soon as possible, once they got saved. It was one of the arguments I had when I was in a, a church as a young Christian. I said, look, people here get baptised ten years after they got saved. Why? It seems in the New Testament they got saved and they got baptised. The first baptisms I ever did were in the lake in Trent Park. Because he used to be a teacher training college and a number of the students got saved. So we said that we'd baptise them. So we got permission. I don't know who we asked, but we got permission. I don't generally ask for these things, but I find it's better not to ask. But two of us jumped in the water and sunk immediately up to our way <laughs> Then it occurred to us that we and marsh gas came up. Have you ever smelled marsh gas? It's revolting. The first people we baptised died. <laughs> Nearly literally. <laughs> but you know what baptism is about? It's dying to sin and self, and it allows the Lordship of Christ in our lives. That's what happens. You know what we teach? We teach that someone who's baptized has put up a sign under new management. <laughs> under new management. You're telling the world, you're telling your friends, you're telling your enemies, you're telling the angels. You're telling the devil that Jesus Christ is Lord in you. And that's what baptism should be about. Nail your colours to the mast as soon as you become a Christian. 
that's a, that's a piece of advice I've been giving for years. If you go to a new job, now you're close to the mask. Yeah. Yeah. It'll avoid people telling you things you don't want to hear. Yeah. It'll avoid all kinds of situations. Now you're close to the mask. And baptism is doing that spiritually. Something happens at baptism, you know. Yeah. Something really happens. God does something in you and in me. You can go to some nations, I've been in some of these nations in Eastern Europe, where they don't mind if you're a Christian. You can be a Christian and get baptised. That's when the trouble starts. Yeah. God's in it. Yeah. Teaching. We've got to, uh, we've got to commit to faithful men and women the truth that we've ourselves received by the Holy Spirit. And they, in turn, teach others. 